Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. The Westminster Institute has been concentrating on human rights, religious freedom, foreign policy and national defense issues for a considerable number of years, certainly for the eight years in which I've been its director. But the state of America is perhaps the key question that needs to be addressed. These other issues aren't going to matter much if the United States collapses from within. A recent NPR Ipsos poll, for instance, said that 70% of Americans believe the US is in crisis and at risk of failing. So we're here to an attempt and answer to the very daunting question, what is the state of America? Joining me are two guests who are superbly qualified to attempt an answer to this question. First, we have Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, is Vice President of the Middle East Media Research Institute, a position he held prior to serving as the President of the Middle East Broadcasting Network, which is part of the US government's Agency for Global Media. He held that position for three years before returning to memory. He served as a foreign service officer from 1983 to 1985. He was a career member of the US Senior Foreign Service, achieving its highest rank of minister counselor. He was U.S. Ambassador to Equatorial Guinea and U.S. Charge d'Affaires to Sudan. He held senior public diplomacy positions at the U.S. embassies in Afghanistan, Jordan, Syria, Guatemala, Kuwait, and in the State Department's Near East Affairs Bureau. He also served as the State Department's coordinator for the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications from 2012 to 2015. A graduate of the University of Arizona in both his undergraduate and graduate degrees and of the Defense Language Institute. Alberto served in the US Army and came to the United States as a refugee from Cuba in 1959. He is a prolific writer, most recently authoring the article Out With the Olds, in with the news, an analysis of America's woke cultural revolution. Our other guest is Mark Tooley, who is the president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and editor of the Institute's foreign policy and national security journal, Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. He worked eight years for the Central Intelligence Agency and is a graduate of Georgetown University. In 1994, Mark uh, joined IRD to found its United Methodist Project and became IRD president in 2009. He's the author of several books, including Methodism and Politics in the 20th Century, from William McKinley to 9-11, and The Peace That Almost Was, The Forgotten Story of the 1861 Washington Peace Conference and the final attempt to avert the Civil War. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, Law and Liberty, National Review, and other publications. He contributed chapters to several books, including Race and Covenant, Recovering the Religious Roots for American Reconciliation, Just War and Christian Traditions, and Social Conservatism for the Common Good. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. What thank is you. the state of America? There are many ways, there are so many aspects of uh, addressing this question. I, perhaps one of the most fundamental ones is, uh, is America, American culture losing its moral and ethical roots? I mean, you know, I think when we address these issues, obviously the easy the default questions to say things are terrible and, uh, you know, we're living in Babylon and, uh, uh, you know, we're collapsing. And, and I think that case can very well be made. But I always do think that one has to have a perspective in the sense that if you look at American history, there have been many different, you know, peaks and valleys and 
you know, uh, when we talk about, for example, political, uh, uh, you know, uh, polarization, the late 60s and early 70s was a time of uh, great political violence in the United States, the so-called days of rage, uh, mostly from the left. Um, so we've, you know, we've, we've had many bad things, uh, certainly when you talk about political culture and uh, the, the state of the nation. I, I think that we have ample reasons to be deeply worried and, and deeply concerned. However, I do think we have to be a little careful about kind of this, you know, just kind of saying that it's over. America is going to collapse. Uh, I, I think America could very well be collapsing morally and spiritually. I think that's a, a very good case that we can make. However, at the same time, the United States, for all of its moral and spiritual failings, is one of the two big countries in the world, which is essentially autarkic, you know, the other one being, of course, Russia, big country with a large population that can feed itself and that is armed to the teeth. So America as a polity, as an entity, I think has a lot going for it that other countries do not. Now, that is completely separate from, you know, America as a, a moral project or a, a paragon to the world or a healthy society or anything like that. So I would just kind of, you know, I'd like to differentiate between those two things because I think things are terrible. However, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, uh, a collapse in, in the sense of a, a physical or complete collapse. Um, that's kind of the way I see it. I mostly agree with uh, the ambassador. My, he spoke of uh, the tumult of the 1960s and 1970s, the anti-war protest and uh, the sometimes uh, violence of the far left. My earliest political memory is at age six in 1971, my mother took me to the uh, May Day anti-war mobilization in DC where several hundred thousand hippies literally tried to shut down the government by blocking the streets. It made a huge uh, impact on me. and. Uh, it seemed like everything was imploding. I believe over 10,000 were arrested that day and put into RFK Stadium, the largest mass arrest in US history. Of course, we still have the war going on. Uh, 40,000 already been killed. I believe another 10,000 would be before the US finally withdrew. And that was disastrous in terms of the collapse of Southeast Asia to the communists. So uh, would I rather be alive in 1971 or 2022? I think I prefer 2022. Uh, when I look at the difference, for example, in race relations and how we think about racial minorities 50 years ago, which I can still vaguely remember versus now, inf infinitely preferable now compared to then. What most concerns me would be the, uh, the retreat of institutional Christianity in America. It was the church had often mediated most of the national moral, cultural, and political crises and as the institutional church commands less and less loyalty from a large percentage of Americans, uh, that vacuum is very dangerous and will be filled by something else, probably not as helpful as the institutional church. Those are two very important points, Mark. And, but let's, let's stay on that first one you made uh, in which you pointed out that race relations in the United States are infinitely better than they were, say, in the 1960s. However, two years ago, the George Floyd killing in Minnesota caused enormous riots uh, across a number of cities in the United States. The purported pretext for them was, of course, police uh, brutality and racism and unfair treatment of Blacks. And uh, this became the mantra that underlay the famous slogan, Black Matter, which you can still see in the uh, yard signs of a, a number of American homes. So it was that event and, and the violence that attended it that sent a different message. And, and the message of course was that racism is rampant in the United States. Then the accusation came from the 16th 19 project that America was based on, founded on racism, and that it's so institutionally embedded that only institutional destruction will solve it. 
So I mean, you're saying it's getting better. They were saying it's not only perhaps worse, but insolvable. Well, is racism worse than 50 years ago? I think that's an almost uh, absurd assertion that can be made by people who are very, very young or people who have no historical memory. Uh, not long before I was born, the, the Freedom Riders were still uh, trying to take uh, public transportation to the South on Greyhound buses and were attacked by rioters and uh, beaten and the local police would not intervene to protect them. That was the situation uh, at the time of my birth that seems unimaginable. Now, even in my childhood, I can recall, recall people in the Washington area using the N-word freely and unapologetically. That would be completely unacceptable now. But, you know, people are by nature ungrateful. We've made tremendous improvements in racial attitudes, and yet our human tendency is to ignore that and to complain and bewail about where we are. But the other problem gets to my earlier point, the retreat of the institutional church with the retreat of institutional Christianity. We no longer have uh, the spiritual understanding or the spiritual tools to understand uh, forgiveness and mediation and moving forward. So we do have this tremendous stain of racism in our history and we're unable to, but we've persuaded, many of us have persuaded ourselves we have to tear down the whole system because it cannot be redeemed. I think with the tools of Christianity, we understand, no, humanity has always fallen, but redemption is always available. Alberto, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, no, I think uh, Mark is uh, absolutely right. Of course, it's, I know you've said, Mark, uh, you know, the only people who would think that are the very young or people with no historical memory. Unfortunately, we have people that are both very young and have no historical memory. Uh, so we are going to have people who are going to think that uh, that there's more racism today uh, than, than there was in the past. And, you know, I, I wrote a recent piece for memory and I, uh, Pew did a study of the American electorate. Pew Research did a study and it found that, you know, the most left-wing part of the American electorate, 6%, the most progressive part of it, tends to be well-educated, privileged, or comfortable economically, often white, and yet it is that demographic that in the Pew research was the most likely to want American institutions to be completely demolished and redone because of institutional racism. So it's this kind of this paradox that the percentage, the, the part of the electorate, which is very well educated, very comfortable and also, to be frank, very white was the one that was the most dismissive of what we have and wanted it to be demolished. In fact, African Americans were less extreme than than that uh, demographic. So, so, so I do think that there there is a problem of kind of no historical memory and uh, certainly among the young, the people having kind of misapprehensions. I also think there is a problem that we don't talk about, which is extremely complicated. I agree with you. I think there is less racism today than there was in the 70s. And I was a little kid. I don't remember it very well either. But America is different than it was in the 70s. And uh, one of my big concerns is that uh, in America today, so much of what is seen is seen in this kind of binary black white situation and the reality is america is becoming much more complex in its kind of ethnic makeup and it, it's something that we don't you know people are uncomfortable the, you know, the term people of color was created to kind of try to put all, all of this brown people in the same category and i think the world is not really like that it's it's uh, more common. So I feel we've come out of the kind of the racism that existed in the 60s and 70s, and yet we're entering in another situation where we, we're living a kind of very racialist um, uh, world where there's this kind of zero-sum game situation being played. Um, and I agree with you completely. This glue or this bond that uh, that Christianity can bring um, is frayed and missing in so many places. So we have the condemnation and the heat and the anger of the past 
without the forgiveness, uh, without the you know absolution that uh, that faith that a shared faith can give. Uh, and I think that's a very dangerous thing. I remember this, uh, somebody said it, you know, if, uh, if, if you don't like the Christian right, wait until you have the post-Christian right, right? But I think that's true of the post-Christian right, post-Christian left, post-Christian center, I think is a very, very scary thing. Well, both of you know the famous quote from Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Wherein he said, and I'm, I'm quoting from him, there is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than America, unquote. Mark, you spoke of the deinstitutionalization of religion in America. How did that happen and how damaging is it? Well, it's very damaging, although I would point out that probably as a percentage of Americans, there are more people who are regular churchgoers now than there were in the 1830s when Tocqueville was writing. Uh, probably always black people lived in more remote locations, but we shouldn't over-Christianize America's past. But nonetheless, I think Christianity had a greater hold over the commanding heights of culture uh, when Tocqueville was writing than certainly it does today, and it, it leaves this uh, tremendous spiritual vacuum in which people, especially uh, the people we like to call is the, the elites, the educated elites, uh, when they are not bound to any institutional religion and therefore to validate themselves, to gain righteousness for themselves, they have to virtue signal and adopt the latest uh, cause du jour, whether it's Black Lives Matters or the LGBT cause or whatever is going to come across tomorrow. So they're on that constant treadmill that they can never uh, co completely keep up on. And I, the only solution is, I think, is uh, the reinvigoration of organized religion in America. One of our challenges today is, uh, I mean, there are obviously tens of millions of Americans who are still religiously devout, but they're increasingly less and less time to uh, church institutions, increasingly post-denominational, and they just don't have any deep connection to historic Christianity. So how do we address that? Maybe you two being Catholic, you have the answer, but for those of us who are, are Protestants, it's a little more complicated. How do you re-institutionalize Protestants and evangelicals who have left uh, the great denominations and are off doing something else? Well, I agree. Of course, we Catholics have a, a whole slew of, of tremendous problems uh, as well. And, uh, you know, when you talk about losing people, the Catholic Church also has a challenge of losing people. I mean, obviously, one of the deep challenges, uh, which has always been true, which has always been true from, the, you know, the, the time of the apostles is is making one's faith uh, 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 relevant and real and connected to people, you know, uh, and that challenge is was has always been true in the history of the church, and it's true today. And the danger also of kind of watering down the Christianity, watering down the gospel, following the latest fashion, the latest cause has always been a risk there and so so you you do need people who are going to kind of have a clear vision of the truth and a clear understanding of how how to present it and i think this is a challenge i think across um, the institutional church uh, writ large uh, and and i think what's happened i think and mark you you you've written about this so correct me if i'm wrong one of the challenges and i think uh, Robert, I mean, you've lived this as well, is that there was a time when there were these kind of religious guardrails in America. You know, there was a kind of, aside from real faith, there was a kind of um, uh, societal expectation, right? To be a Christian was expected, more or less. And I don't know if this died out in this, you know, I think it began dying out in the 50s, 60s, 70s, but Today, to be a Christian and to be a Christian in the public public square has a price, has a real price. It's um, it's less convenient, right? It's less acceptable than it was. Um, and so I think there's a tremendous challenge to reach people who are 
the same people with the same issues and the same sins that have always existed, but, um, uh, you know, doing it in this environment where there aren't these kind of cultural guardrails or the kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, you know, the, the cultural Christianity that exists in a society regardless of the regardless of the beliefs that individuals may have right the personal beliefs that people may have you know a, a southern writer uh, came up with a very attractive phrase <clears throat> describing his youth uh, a youth back in the 40s and 50s that he was cornered into virtue precisely by the christian culture that was still extant at that time but we're talking about a possible collapse from within in America and Mark, some of the Christian religions collapsing from within. You have been a courageous and stalwart defender of Christian orthodoxy within uh, the Methodist faith. When, I, I don't know whether I, I, as a Catholic, I would be in a position to say certain sectors of that faith apostatize by going against such fundamental Christian teachings about marriage, about the immorality of uh, homosexual acts and about the nature of, of the laity and the priesthood. So you, you have been a witness to this and you have been combating it. Can you, so you have an inside view of the, the internal forces of corrosion. Could you talk about that? Yes, Jody Bottom, uh, the former editor of uh, First Things magazine, uh, wrote a book uh, about this. An Anxious Age, the Post-Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of America. It basically was about the collapse of mainline Protestantism and how the secular elites of today are basically post-mainline Protestants. They still have that elite attitude, sort of detached attitude, but they've lost the faith and they've lost the institutional attachments to the church. And I think that we constantly underestimate the social, cultural, and political impact of the collapse of the great historic Protestant denominations that really guided America across four centuries. The Episcopalians and the Methodists and the Lutherans and uh, uh, others uh, who now have almost completely receded from the scene and have been replaced either by secularism or by a, a post-denomination or, or non-denominational Christianity, which has many strengths, but also many weaknesses and is much less connected to uh, the pillars of support of our democracy that the old line denomination had. So, uh, Alberto, there was something uh, you said with which I think Mark would agree that Christian culture across the various denominations in a more traditional America uh, provided guardrails, uh, certainly morally speaking, but also in the general view of life that the meaning of life uh, was achieved in the transcendent, not in this world. That there were moral dislocations, disturbances in our souls, original sin, um, uh, personal sin, which we as human beings were incapable of extirpating ourselves. We, we, we couldn't save ourselves. Therefore, we look to a savior and that savior being Jesus Christ. Now, when that belief weakens or is removed, those problems still remain under different names, perhaps. And, and therefore, the, so the, the approach to solutions to those problems becomes um, within this world, no longer transcendent solution, but let's say an imminent one, which leads to this, these millenarian ideologies. When I was uh, witnessing the riots uh, following the George Floyd killing, and went on for some time, seizing cities, uh, defund the police and so forth, what fired the grievances of these young people? And it seemed to me it wasn't just the specific act of injustice against which they were reacting. It was sort of the grounds of their own existence. They thought that the reason why they weren't completely happy was someone else's fault. 
that something must have been taken from them. And they mean to get it back, not through those traditional means that Christianity always provided, which was humble service, prayer, uh, self-control, um, moral behavior, honoring your parents, etc. cetera. Uh, do you both agree with that general assessment? Yeah, sure. Look, uh, what ha what happened is, uh, you know, and Mark talks about, you know, the collapse of the of the great uh, Protestant uh, denominations and and faith in general is that uh, you know we all have that uh, God shaped vacuum and that vacuum will be filled or it will be satisfied in some way and we often talk about like you know drugs and sex and stuff like that that people do but. But there are other things, kind of worldly things, like the world of politics, right? I mean, because of uh, utopia, you know, kind of utopian politics, uh, which of course is a, is is a, a you know a a clear mark uh, in leftist politics that we've seen, you know, from the years of uh, of of the Bolsheviks. So, so of course. Um, People are going to look for ways to fill that vacuum. And one of the ways that has happened even before the 2020 has been activism, right? Uh, and I think one can say that, you know, so much of what is very good things often that have been done by secular or liberal or human rights or ecological rights or whatever rights organizations, all of those, of course, are offsprings from something which is comes from Christianity, right? It's a kind of a secularized version of, of Christian service. It's being a missionary. It's being an evangelist, except you're being an evangelist for the whales or for climate change or for social justice or whatever. So yes, absolutely. There is a tremendous, uh, you know, kind of reaction to that. People are, there's this ferment that exists that needs to be answered. One of the challenges is going to be is how people, people of faith, how they address this post-Christian world or people that uh, don't have these kind of uh, general understanding of, uh, of kind of Abrahamic religions writ large, but are uneasy, unhappy, and there's a problem in how you're going to reach those people and communicate to them. Mark, do you want to... Another effect of the retreat of institutional Christianity in America has been the increasing propensity to uh, horribleize everything as though bad stuff wasn't always happening everywhere all the time throughout America, uh, throughout uh, human history. So, uh, you know, if you're a Christian, Catholic or Protestant, you recall the scripture that uh, Satan is roaming the earth like a, a, a roaring lion. And so uh, there's always been evil among us, but in this new secular age, when something horrible happens, it's treated as uh, extraordinary and somehow evidence of perhaps uh, the end of the world, or at least the end of the world uh, as we know it. And we lose our sense of perspective and realism. Yeah, we have anathemas, but we have no repentance or no true repentance and forgiveness. Mark, your extraordinarily fine journal, Providence, a journal of... Uh, Christianity and foreign policy has to address the impact of some of these issues on our foreign policy and how to address the harm uh, that that has occasioned. I could give some examples if, if that would help. But as a good friend of mine was the number two person in AID, the Agency for International Development um, for Asia uh, for three years in the Trump administration. And had indeed, he was, he had lived in Central Asia for many years. He knew the territory. And of his experience, he told me, uh, Bob, you must understand that the soft power of the United States is gone. We have been promoting uh, Abortion, the uh, LG flag flying from our embassy in Kabul and other places. 
whereas uh, these Asian peoples uh, still have traditional family cultures and they don't want that. And, and that's what America has officially come to represent and has promoted and has used its foreign aid uh, to promote. Can you speak to the damage this might have done? And is there any way to address it? Well, you're right. It is very damaging for America and the West to be uh, conflated by the religious, traditionally religious majority of the world, conflated with secularism and uh, uh, sexual permissiveness, and the breakdown of the family. And uh, it's hard for us to repair our culture from where we are, but the work must begin. Our journal focuses on uh, stressing uh, Christian realism, a school of thought associated with Reinhold Niebuhr, but uh, more deeply and historically uh, Augustinian and uh, stressing the fact that uh, humanity is intrinsically sinful, but we do what we can with the tools that God gives us to advance some approximate good. And so, uh, as you say, utopian schemes, domestic or international, are doomed to failure. We have to work for incremental change where it's possible. And so hopefully if we can rebuild uh, traditional uh, religious and moral beliefs in America, that will be reflected in our foreign policy, but just as important to re-emphasize and to reappreciate the founding principles of America about democracy, about human equality, about equal rights for all. That's the basis of American greatness, true American greatness. That's been America's appeal to the world for most of our history, and it can be appealing. It, I think that message is still there. Often it's muted, but uh, sadly, even many Americans, not just on the left, but also on the right, are increasingly asking questions, are skeptical or disdainful of our founding principles about human equality. In fact, to what extent, and this, many people have commented on what they say is to Americans today, that the nation is so profoundly divided over some of these fundamental issues, including Mark, what you just referred to, the founding of the United States, what were its principles? Were they universal moral principles to which we still adhere? Uh, how do we understand ourselves as a nation? And there seem to be two very different answers to that question that has resulted in a deeply divided United States, which at the extreme leads some people to forecast a civil war. Not something I agree with, but the, the situation is bad enough that it leads a few people in that uh, extreme direction. What do you think? Well, the uh, talk about civil war, I think, uh, from my hopeful perspective, is just mostly uh, online chat, people who like to bloviate. But this kind of rhetoric is not helpful. And uh, again, regarding our founding principles, you all may have seen the student newspaper at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, advocate that all reference to Thomas Jefferson be deleted from the campus of the University of Virginia, because, of course, he was a slaveholder and uh, the uh, infamous uh, far-right racist demonstration that took place in Charlottesville several years ago gathered at uh, the Jefferson statue and therefore his legacy belonged to white supremacy and uh, should be canceled, which is absurd. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence stipulating that God created all humans to be equal. That document ensured the eventual eradication of slavery. That document led directly to the foundation of the civil rights movement. That document was quoted almost verbatim by Martin Luther King. And the legacy of Thomas Jefferson is one of democracy, human rights, religious freedom, equality for all. It does not belong to white supremacy. Yet we have people on uh, the ignorant far left and people on the far right who are wanting to jettison Thomas Jefferson and others of our founders for some other uh, vision of America that is uh, utopian or rather malevolent. I might just quickly add, Mark, that Jefferson was responsible for the introduction of some 10 pieces of legislation 
that would have manumitted the slaves and abolished slavery uh, in his state of Virginia. And also, of course, he supported and had had a line that was subsequently taken out of uh, the Declaration of Independence, specifically naming uh, the great evil of slavery. So yes, he was caught in, uh, he, he held slaves, no one will gainsay that, but there was no one firmer in his condemnation of this institution as an evil, not only for the slaves themselves, obviously, but for the slaveholders. And of course, if you come from a religious perspective, you can understand that someone like Jefferson, like all of us, a sinner, flawed, even when he's trying to do his best, living in very complicated, challenging circumstances, but still used by God to do good. Uh, we, uh, we who are Christians have this narrative in the Bible of lots of uh, very flawed and even bad people whom God uses to advance the cause of good. But if you're operating from a secular perspective, you have to resort to a certain uh, perfectionism where you have to cancel and uh, delete and denounce everyone who doesn't live up to your uh, expectations of the last five minutes. Of course, this same treatment was given to Abraham Lincoln of all people, the great liberator, the man who led the United States in the Civil War, thank God successfully, which did lead to the extirpation of slavery. But there have been attempts to remove his statues, to, to defame him, to call him a racist. Well, all of this does point, I think, it has the ideological component to it, which both of you have uh, spoken about. But we ought to talk about the decline of education in the United States, the general decline of it, and to what extent it's responsible for this, and what were the reasons behind that decline? My area is more foreign policy than uh, education. I don't know what uh, exactly the reasons for the decline. Uh, obviously, we have the challenge that, uh, you know, a kind of a, a new ideology or successor ideology has uh, successfully completed the institutional capture of many organizations and entities that guide uh, education, culture, formation, you know, the universities, et cetera. And so you basically have a, a narrative that forms, which is a narrative of America, even before the 1619 project, right? As uh, America and its founding, its history as deeply problematic, deeply uh, flawed, evil, we, I mean, we all accept that America is flawed like any other, you know, human institution. But there's, you know, this kind of anti-American, anti-West narrative is deeply embedded now in our, you know, kind of cultural educational elites. And, uh, you know, in my piece, I wrote, you know, the piece I wrote about the state of America, you know, I talked that there, there certainly will be a reaction. There'll be a reaction against it at the ballot box sooner or later, maybe not this year, maybe in two years, whatever, but absent a change in the kind of the dominant institutions that formulate a, a national narrative and kind of formulate education, a culture, indoctrination, without a change there, I'm actually somewhat pessimistic about the United States in that sense, in the sense of kind of its view of itself and its people's view of the United States itself. Because I don't think that a kind of a nihilistic, hostile worldview of American society and institutions is going to be able to engender people who can appreciate nuance, they can appreciate that. For example, Jefferson, a great man with some great flaws and others in our history and, you know, darkness and light in our own history. And so I fear there was a recent incident that happened with the head of the American Historical Association where he basically, he wrote about, I don't know if you, if you followed it, he wrote a, 
a, a, a piece, you know, talking about his fear that ideologues were basically going to take over or are taking over the teaching of history. And his, and his comments were very nuanced. And he talked about the problems of racism and he talked about how the right, you know, he had the, the, the expected anti-Trump bromides and, you know, he checked all the boxes, right, that is expected from a kind of a, a, an ordinary liberal educator. But he also warned about kind of this concern about kind of uh, the politicization of the teaching of history. Well, he received the kind of, after it came out, he received just a kind of a firestorm of criticism. Of course, he wound up, as always happens these days, in the kind of, you know, mea culpa, auto de fe kind of apologetic situation of uh, groveling for what he'd said. So I'm actually a bit pessimistic. If the center right is not able to recapture these kind of institutions that formulate kind of the national narrative, I think the problem situation is going to continue, it's going to get bad, it's going to get worse. Yes, I was recently reading a Washington Post article about, it was about these issues and uh, a school teacher was talking about taking her class to a, a Virginia state park where she was horrified to find a, a statue or a memorial to uh, former Governor Harry Burr, who was running the state and, as a senator and governor for about 40 years and was unfortunately a segregationist, but uh, his career included much more than that. She was so traumatized and fearful that the children, if they noticed this statue memorial, they might have a complete meltdown on the scene. Well, of course, they wouldn't even know who Harry Bird was. But this idea that children are so fragile, that it can't be explained to them that human life is complicated. People are complicated. Everyone is a combination of good and bad and uh, including ourselves. So we have to be a little bit reluctant about looking our nose down on other people and maybe reflect on our own shortcomings. So yes, this is uh, where we are. We're uh, a lot of uh, very fragile people, adults, and children who can't be exposed to anything that we potentially might disagree with. It's curious that the 1619 Project, uh, which was denounced by a number of extremely distinguished liberal historians who simply said, this is, you've got the facts wrong. You're, you're making absurd uh, uh, statements in here that are unsupported by any historical sources. And I, I, having, I also read the 1619 Project and wrote my own book chapter about it. None of this seemed to, none of this stopped the distribution of the 1619 project with teaching tools into thousands of high schools in the United States. Because I suppose it comported with this attitude that both of you have been describing, that is, it's congruent with the idea that uh, it's it's the United States' is fault, the founding, the founding, the original sin, uh, that that's, that's the irredeemable problem from which we're all suffering. So even when it, it, it's, it's so apparent that the contentions are incorrect, it's unstoppable. Alberto is a former diplomat, uh knows he has a great appreciation for the, for the world as it is. Uh, but this uh, 1619 narrative, I, I think, uh, imagines the world as some sort of uh, Arcadia and America is uh, the uh, exception in terms of being this uh, deep abyss of uh, discrimination and racism and oppression. And uh, with that narrative, I don't know how you explain how tens of millions of people from around the world have voluntarily moved to America across 300 years and very few of them are the descendants have left or have any desire to leave. And yet somehow we leave out uh, the rest of the story about the world just in the last century in terms of uh, what happened in Nazi Germany, what happened in Stalinist Russia, what happened in Maoist China, tens of millions of people uh, murdered by their own governments. Uh, the world is not an Arcadia in America for all of its uh, sins, uh, tends to be uh, a relative refuge for those who are seeking some level of uh, decent life. 
yeah, we've gone from the American exceptionalism that America was uniquely great to the American exceptionalism of America is uniquely evil. The kind of, you know, kind of a cultural shift that's that's happened. Uh, I do worry about the effect of this on foreign policy. I feel that uh, an America which is in turmoil, which is at war with itself, is not a good international role model. I mean, Mark is absolutely right. America's attraction as a society for ordinary people will remain. But uh, in the kind of battle, global battle of ideas, you know, an America which is at odds with the world also in the sense of not understanding that the world is a world of faith, not understanding the world is complicated, that the only path is this kind of westernization, which is a very specific kind of, you know, progressive agenda. I don't think that's good for U.S. foreign policy writ large. And certainly our enemies use the fact the progressive agenda, you know, package is used by our adversaries, not just the Russians, but um, uh, used certainly in the Middle East, which I follow closely. It's often used to point to, you know, how we fall in. We don't have a link. In the, and so we have no reason, no ability to criticize them. This came out in the, when uh, President Biden went to Saudi Arabia. There were various commentators who said that, you know, we have have nothing to be ashamed of compared to the Americans. The Americans after George Floyd, after after January and everything else, the Americans have nothing to offer to us and the whole agenda as well. They threw that in as well. The Americans have absolutely nothing to say to us or offer to us. I think that what Mark said, I see firsthand. I see the promise of America working all around me. And I'm sure you've both been to the swearing-in ceremonies at uh, U.S. Immigration, where you see people from all over the world with tears of happiness when they swear their fealty to the United States to become a U.S. citizen. So, Not oh, just been to them. I was one of you them. You were one of them. My wife, 12 years old. Yeah, my wife, is, <laughs> my wife is one of them. So there's something still, something here still works that we simply haven't been talking about or that's been suppressed by the forces that be in, in the uh, media and in the educational elite and in the cultural elite. Though not, though not completely. And I'm going to, I'd like to, since I mentioned the military in, in which you served, Alberto, to raise an issue that is a manifestation of the problem we've been talking about. If indeed these young people have an idea that the foundation of their country was grievously faulty, why would they wish to swear their loyalty to the U.S. Constitution and to the country, and if necessary, at the cost of their lives, if they're in the in the uh, U.S. military. Here, I want to refer to some rather uh, extraordinary statistics that come from the Army. There's, first of all, the decline in the number of people physically qualified to serve in the military forces. A quote from the general who is responsible for this in the U.S. Army, General Joseph Martin, that we have gone from 29 to 23 percent of the population ages 17 to 24 that is available to serve because they're not physically qualified. In other words, there's been a physical decline. If you can imagine that only 23 percent of people in that age bracket from 17 to 24 are so suffering from obesity or have indulged so deeply in drugs uh, or have a criminal record that even if they wanted to, they couldn't serve in, in, in the U.S. Armed Forces. There's a record low percentage of young Americans eligible to serve and even a tinier fraction willing to consider it. And indeed, the Army is far behind their recruitment requirements, and they expect it next year to even be worse. I don't mean to suggest, by the way, that nor does this general, that this is all an expression of the problems to which I just alluded. There's also the fact that 
the economy still offers young people a, a lot of opportunities. There are so many job openings. There are decent salaries higher than that that can be obtained in the military that could draw them away. But generally, these the, the, this is true. There's a physical decline in the state of the health of young people. And there is this decline in even their willingness to consider serving their country in this way. Mark, any questions as to why that may be so, other than the things we've already mentioned? They've been exposed to the denigration of the country and, and a steady stream of things. Is that why they're unlikely to do it? Well, uh, I don't know. You mentioned fewer and fewer people are physically qualified, so that's a, a public health situation. Uh, I can't address that, but uh, I do think there are signs of hope. A friend of mine has written, he's actually been active in uh, fighting for greater immigration control. So whatever you think about that, but his new book is actually optimistic in terms of reviewing the data in terms of how immigrants of the last 20 years have successfully integrated into American society and they're climbing economically are becoming more politically diverse, much more Republican than they would have been 20 years ago, overwhelmingly English speaking, largely patriotic. So whatever the public education system is doing, it isn't necessarily successfully persuading immigrants that they should not be patriotic and enthusiastic Americans, because in fact uh, they are, and we should not underestimate our nation's capacity for reinventing itself, and rejuvenating itself. We do, I think we're relatively unique in the world for having, maybe it's a myth, maybe we are mistaken or we exaggerate our capacity to reinvent ourselves. And yet it is this myth, whatever seems to be sustained across generations. And I think it's actually a cause for hope and uh, one of the bases of America's strengths. You know, Mark used the word myth twice, and we need myths, you know. Uh, there are national myths. These are narratives. These are how we see ourselves and our identity and our past and our place in the world. This is something which is organic, and, and America has this organically, has this latent power because of our history, our very unique history. It also needs to be nurtured. It's not something, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a police state where you have, this is the party myth. This is the way you're supposed to believe in this thing. But it's something that's both organic and that has to be nurtured. You know, kind of a love of country, not some kind of base nationalism, but a inclusive and warm and expansive patriotism is something that is in, that, that can be encouraged and that can be nurtured and which has to be nurtured without kind of, you know, suffocating propaganda. I think you both have mentioned the fact that the United States has come back from very serious problems, which is, it has had in the past. I would only add that America has been misjudged by its foreign adversaries a number of times. It certainly was by Japan in World War II, and it certainly was by Nazi Germany. Americans were denigrated. I've, I've read Hitler's own remarks about Americans being a commercial people immersed in their pleasures and uh, the consumption of, of worldly goods, and they haven't the martial fiber to stand up to us. So we were, we were supposed to be pushovers and both Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany learned otherwise. A more immediate memory is 9-11. And Alberto is particularly aware of how America was judged by Osama bin Laden and other radical Islamists as a thoroughly corrupt materialist people lost in malls, shopping for ever larger home entertainment centers. They found out otherwise. In fact, I was the, the director of the Voice of America at the time saying, why is it so much the world is surprised at 
our response, the American the dignity and bearing of the American people as they conducted the funerals for those who were lost by the patriotic fervor of the many who stepped up to military service, who left successful careers on Wall Street to serve in the military in a combat branch. I recall many Europeans being amazed because they too thought America was too corrupt to respond in this way. And so I mentioned to the staff, that's our fault. We can't blame the, the general American media whose job is to tell bad news and, and uh, to entertain in a way. Ours is to tell the story about the American character that they wouldn't otherwise hear. And now things have, have changed since 9-11. We can't say in any way that they've gotten better. Do we still have the fiber to react the next time we're hit? Is there still enough underlying character and patriotism to replicate that performance, do you think? Well, I think there is, uh, but it depends on what for. Uh, I think that there is a kind of innate patriotism among Americans. There is, a, there is an innate uh, sense of service of, of, um, uh, of people wanting to protect their country and serve their country. However, if, if, if you, you try to conflate or confuse the defense of the country to the defense or the pro, uh, promulgation of a kind of a global American empire with a progressive agenda, which is not shared by people, that's not a really very attractive proposition. So I think the American people would always defend their country. I think that, that there are true patriots who would do that and soldiers that would do that. Another misadventure, I mean, you talked about 9-11, right? Uh, that whole exercise left a very bad taste in people's mouths, how it ended, right? It's one thing to uh, fight back against the people that hit us, you know, on 9-11, the Salafi jihadists who attacked the United States. That was a national cause and people were in favor of that. 20 years later, uh, you know, a lot of the American people were tired of Afghanistan and wondering, you know, why were we in Iraq at the service of a regime, you know, government that's mostly was mostly controlled by Iran. You know, we kind of lost our way along the way. So so I would just kind of make that differentiation. I think there are there, there would be people that defend America, but defend her from what and for what? I think Americans are naturally patient no matter what may, may be going on in the universities or the public school systems. And who we are, what we are, is the accumulation of our history for the last 400 years. And that's, uh, that history is very difficult to undo. I think it's uh, built into our cultural DNA. And I think that strength will sustain us through any future crises. It's also been a reminder to us, the war in Ukraine, that uh, um, democracies in America especially are very, very self-reflective, uh, self-critical, obsessed with our faults. Uh, but at least we do have these conversations and the capacity to self-reform, hopefully as a result of them. The dictatorships constantly lie to each other and dictator quite never be sure what's actually going on in their own country. So we've seen this happen with uh, Putin and what's happening to his forces in Ukraine. And that's a mistake that dictatorships and authoritarian, authoritarian regimes make over and over and over. Regimes built on lies and therefore removed from reality. If we, I may close with this big question. What are the sources of renewal within American society today? If we are faced with decline in religion, decline in family, decline in morals, even physical decline, what is it that can be done or perhaps has already been done to restore ourselves? First of all, spiritually and in other important ways. Well, I mean, I think of that term that Edmund Burke used about the small platoons, um, you know, the small things. I think the biggest defense and the biggest service that we can make to America, obviously we have to be good citizens, but it's to be right with 
our families, with our communities, with our churches, and to strengthen them and protect them in this, uh, you know, lost world that we're in. And when I was in the military, there was this line, they said, you know, you can't do everything, you should fix the foxhole that you're in, right? So we need to fix the foxhole that we're in. Yes, dream big, but take care of these things, you know, first of all. Those are the building blocks of everything else and of future greatness. I agree with Alberto, this uh, sense, so uh, the strong sense of the individual to uh, shape your own destiny, to uh, plan and shape the uh, future, to work for a better tomorrow, that uh, we are not static, we're not wedded to the past. There are always new possibilities. The unique gift of American culture, of our uh, crossing the Atlantic and conquering the frontier, there's always a better day that we could work for. I would like to offer my own observation that I see in the realm of education, not only the homeschooling that's been going on for quite some time, parents so concerned about the nature of public education that they educate their children in concert with other families that are uh, doing the same thing but the creation of new schools, new schools based upon traditional education and sound religious values. There is a, a, almost an underground of such educational institutions. They're small, but growing. And also you see that in higher education with private schools. You have the great example of Hillsdale College in Michigan and it's President Larry Arn. It's now one of the hardest schools to get into in the United States. And I'll close just with uh, some personal anecdotes and, and things that do give me hope in young people who undertake to do the hardest things. Thank you very much, Ambassador Alberto Fernandez from the Middle East Media Research Institute and Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy, for joining me today to answer the question, what is the state of America? Now, I urge our audience to go to the Westminster Institute website or to our YouTube channel, where you can see the other subjects we've been covering, China, Taiwan, Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East, uh, and, and other matters. And you also please can uh, go through our list of offerings to find the fine contributions from Alberto Fernandez and his other appearances. So thank you again for joining us. I'm Robert Riley.